Okay, uh, welcome. Um, good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. It's a great honor to moderate this PUP Global Scholar Talk on US-China relations and the international order. My name is Daniel Bell and I'm Dean of the School of Political Science and Public Administration at Shandong University in beautiful Qingdao. And I'm also the author of books by Princeton University Press and an editor of the Princeton China series. And today I will chair this talk featuring Professor John Eikenberry from Princeton University and Professor Yen Xue Tong from Tsinghua University. Now this PUP Global Scholar Talk is a series event initiated by Princeton University Press to build as a platform for scholarly conversations between the West and China. And Princeton University Press invites distinguished authors from various fields and disciplines to talk about important issues and cutting edge concerns to further promote scholarly ideas and extend the influence of academic publishing. The PUP Global Scholar Talk series events it bears on our mission of promoting academic dialogues and cross-cultural intellectual exchanges. Now, I think we all know that US-China relations are not in a great state at this moment, but I think we can also agree that it's very important to have academic exchanges of this sort. So it's a great honor to be part of it. So today's event is a second talk in the series. And again, on the topic of US-China relations, it's supported by the Institute of International Relations at Tsinghua University and Tea House, an opinion platform that provides in-depth analysis, unique insights and expert commentary on the events shaping China and the world under China Global Television Network. Now, let me introduce the two speakers. Professor G. John Eikenberry is the Albert G. Milbank Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University in the Department of Politics and Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. He's also the co-director of Princeton Center for International Security Studies and a fellow of the American Academy, Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Eikenberry is the author of many influential books, including Liberal Leviathan, published by Princeton in 2011, After Victory, also Princeton 2011, Crisis of American po Foreign Policy, Princeton 2009, and four other books. His new books, A World Safe for Democracy, Liberal Internationalism and the Crisis of Global Order, published by Yale, is considered as a sweeping account of the rise and evolution of interna liberal internationalism in the modern era. It's already been uh, reviewed very positively, for example, by uh, Gideon Rachman in the Financial Times. Professor Yen Xue Tong is a distinguished professor at Tsinghua University and a member of the Russian Academy of Science. He serves as the Dean of the Institute of International Relations at Tsinghua University, the Secretary General of the World Peace Forum, and the chief editor of the Chinese Journal of International Politics. His many books, including Leadership and the Rise of Global of Great Powers, published last year by Princeton University Press, and Ancient Chinese Thought, Modern Chinese Power, also published by Princeton. It's worth noting that this book, Ancient Chinese Thought and Modern Chinese Power, it was a famous picture in the New York Times um, when, uh, while well, now President uh, Joe Biden was vice president, he was holding this book, boarding a plane uh, in, in China, back to the US, I guess. And he was photographed holding this book uh, by uh, Yen Shui Tong called Ancient Chinese Thought and Modern Chinese Power. Hopefully um, it will have some impact, not just in China, but in the US as well. Now, Pro Professor Yen Shui Tong is one of the most influential scholars in China and was named one of the world's top 100 public intellectuals by the journal Foreign Policy in 2008. Now in today's event, Professor Eikenberry will engage in a dialogue with Professor Yen on US-China relations and the international order. Let's first welcome Professor Eikenberry, who will speak also based on his new book, A World um, Safe for Democracy, for 20 minutes. And then Professor Yen will speak for 20 minutes. And then we'll have a dialogue for about half an hour. So welcome, Professor Eikenberry. Very pleased to see you, and I hope we can meet live in the not too distant future. Great to see you. Thank you, Professor Bell and Professor Jan. Great to see you, an old friend, and uh, I'm so happy to be on this panel together to talk about our books and talk about U.S.-China relations. I think we've picked a fairly exciting time uh, to do this. Uh, it's both a time in the real world that's exciting uh, in the United States. We have a new president. Uh, 
and globally, of course, with the crises, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, we, we have a lot to, to uh, grapple with as scholars of international relations. So let me start with the, the, the most pressing and most dramatic new development on the American side, the, the, the change in presidencies. So I think this election we've just had is the most uh, important consequential presidential election in my lifetime. I think it really did matter who won. Uh, I think it does say something about leadership and about the role of, 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 of politics and choice uh, uh, as opposed to simple structures producing outcomes. I think there's something that it tells us about the nature of politics. Um, Trump uh, took America and the world, I think, down a very dangerous path uh, for four years, a kind of extraordinary uh, wrecking operation, uh, 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 almost self-consciously trying to undermine um, the key pillars of the international order that has been built over the last 75 years. Think about all the different things he did in trade, in alliances, in public health, in environment, in arms control, in human rights, uh, in, and in what I would call democratic solidarity, the kind of way in which you treat other countries uh, particularly like-minded countries. So I think we are in the midst of a, of a, a world uh, a important uh, shift in American leadership. And the big implication I think is that the United States will attempt to, to reassert itself, to rebuild its status and position, which has suffered. I think the US has weakened itself. It doesn't have the soft power and the prestige that it once had. And I think Biden understands that the currency of the realm is that kind of credibility and, and respect, and he is going to take steps to, to try to re, rebuild it. Uh, for example, rejoining the Paris Agreement, uh, rejoining the WHO, building back through diplomacy, multilateralism, security cooperation, traditional democratic uh, leadership, uh, uh, using the what I'll call the 75 year old playbook of American order building diplomacy, tying American power to institutions, uh, uh, associating American interests with uh, the, the thickening and, and, and building of the fabric of international order as opposed to undermining it, uh, uh, and um, tying American hegemony to uh, creation of institutions that are, are useful for, for multiple states to, to seek their self-interest. And I think the kind of people around Biden, uh, Secretary of State uh, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, I think these people have the, the, what I'll call the liberal internationalist spirit deeply embedded in them. And that in some ways I want to talk a little bit in my time about liberal internationalism and its future uh, to set up our conversation. I do think, and this is my next point, that uh, Biden, while he, I think, is inspiring and is turning a page on American history, he has headwinds a, ahead of him. That is to say, <clears throat> there are huge constraints out there, domestically, a very divided country, and internationally, um, extraordinary challenges uh, uh, of all different sorts uh, unfolding at the global level. So what I would try to say uh, next is that what are the nature of those global struggles or crises that are, are the setting, if you will, for US-Chinese relations. I think there are three crises that we have unfolding simultaneously. One is what I'll call the crisis of geopolitics. This is very familiar ground uh, to Professor Yan and I. This is really the global power transitions, the rise and, and fall of states. And in this case, the, the shift away from the West uh, in terms of of, of power uh, and capabilities, not, at, not uh, absolute, but relative uh, with the rise of China, making room for China and the non-West uh, in an order that had previously been dominated by Western great powers. But it's more than a power struggle that realists map in their theories. It's also a struggle because of the unique nature of these two states. It's a struggle over values and, and uh, uh, visions of, of, of what a good order, an international order looks like. Uh, so the rules and institutions will, sh will reflect differences uh, in what kind of values do we want to protect and promulgate uh, in, at the international level. 
The second crisis is what I call the crisis of modernity. This is really the intensification of economic um, security and environmental interdependence. It's sort of welcome to the Anthropocene era. We are in an era where we are uh, the, the victims of our own industrialism, of our own uh, civilization that is uh, uh, creating um, hazards and dangers in climate, in disease, in weapons of mass destruction that are requiring ever more sophisticated forms of cooperation. So when we ask about the, the future of the international order, it's not simply a question, can we do what we did 50 years ago again, it's we have to do not only that, we have to do more better because the, comp the, the, the nature of the problems are more complicated than the old ones. So looking for new ways to invent order to solve modernity problems that are growing and cascading uh, before our very eyes. Thirdly, uh, this is a crisis more for, for liberal democracies and it's the crisis of, of the the countries, uh, uh, starting with the United States and the Western uh, liberal democratic world, a kind of crisis of, of governability of the polity. Uh, liberal democracy is not doing well. It's, it's in retreat uh, internationally. And the United States, which often sees itself as kind of the first new nation, the first liberal democracy, the most renowned, uh, is, is in many ways in, in trouble uh, in its institutions, polarized, increasingly unequal, plagued by populism. Uh, and I would say there's a deeper crisis that liberal Democrats worry about, and that is a kind of the crisis of the enlightenment, that liberal democracy has always uh, uh, planted its flag on the enlightenment project of open societies, freedom of information, freedom of speech, uh, civil society outside the reach of of, of, of state power, all these sort of features that keep liberal democracy in place are, are threatened in various ways from the inside, from the outside by technology. And so we are really at a point, I think, where liberal, uh, liberal internationalism and liberal democracies uh, are forced to ask really existential questions about what kind of order uh, uh, is possible. How can we rebuild? How can we, we, we rescue those institutions and values that are part of our project. Now, I think the, the troubles uh, of liberal international order um, have deep sources, but there are also more immediate sources. The, I would argue that the elites in the United States uh, uh, um, over the last 20 years uh, who are internationalist and liberal internationalist in orientation have Weakened, been weakened by their own mistakes. And I would just simply say uh, the Iraq war weakened uh, neoconservatives and the 2008 financial crisis weakened uh, uh, neoliberals and liberal internationalists of a different sort. Uh, uh, so the internationalism of the last several decades has not been a, uh, a one of great success. And I would just simply say that for the liberal international vision and the project to continue, uh, there will need to be a kind of reclaiming of the high ground, of re-arguing for its virtues, a, a, even as we seek to reinvent it. And that's, in some sense, what I try to do in this new book. What is there to say about it? Well, in, it, I would defend the proposition that the liberal international order has been uh, one of the most successful international orders in, in, in world history. Think about the last 75 years, the building of a far-flung international order uh, built around economic security, uh, uh, political uh, institutions, bargains, alliances, partnerships, strategic uh, interests and values. A kind of world system was created for states of various sorts, but starting with liberal democracies to, to, to do things, to, to, to achieve uh, uh, various goals, to do work. And, and when we think about international order, I find it very helpful to ask the question, what does the international order do for us? What, does, what problems does it help us solve? And when you think about the last 75 years and the American-led liberal order, it's been extraordinary. It's been a kind of brilliant, 
experiment. Uh, think about the problems that it has helped solve as a kind of forum and platform for, for doing so. Uh, uh, number one, the democracies found a way to open up the world economy after the Great Depression and usher in the, the, a golden age of economic growth and expansion of, of life opportunities across the industrial world. Germany and Japan found a way to move away from fascism and imperialism towards a, a, a reinvention of themselves as civil, uh, civic uh, oriented great powers. Neither of them have nuclear weapons today, yet they are until recently the second and third largest country in the world. So a kind of success story of integrating uh, France and Germany uh, 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 buried uh, 70 really centuries of, of of division to launch the European project. Um, all the industrial societies built uh, 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 new types of polities. We'll call them social democracies. Think about, we're, we often forget about this. The platform of the post-war period created this opportunity for these countries to go from being, we'll call them laissez-faire, limited uh, market societies into what we now call modern welfare states or social democracies. And then there was, of course, the trilateral, multilateral institutions creating Bretton Woods and these other institutions. And then sixth, and almost finally, there was this, um, this uh, uh, um, creation of a platform for transforming societies to find a home. Think about the countries, the smaller countries that were leaving the Soviet orbit after the Cold War. Think about countries in East Asia, South Korea and uh, uh, Taiwan and, and Thailand, Indonesia, all countries that are, were making, throwing off uh, authoritarian or military rule and found a way to buy into a security system and an economic system to gain uh, advantages and, and, and secure themselves. And last but not least, China. China has had its best decades in 2000 years during a period of international order that we call Pax Americana. Think about that. It's, it's quite remarkable that China has found an ability to make a transition from uh, a ideology of rule based on um, uh, Leninism, Maoism, to what we might call a performance legitimacy based on the ability to build a better life for Chinese people. And it did it by tying itself to the liberal international order by taking advantage, often literally taking advantage because not always doing the full suite of, of responsibilities that were part of that liberal order, but creating opportunities for China to pull itself up. Uh, and so when we step back and look at the last international order, I, I think we want to, I would argue, and certainly most Americans would argue, and I think uh, President Biden would argue, we don't want to usher this international order off the stage of history yet. We want to defend it. We want to uh, build it. We want to extend it. We want to uh, invite countries that want to play by the rules within it to be part of it. Um, let me now just say sort of what went wrong. Why are we at this crisis? Well, I mentioned the crises at a kind of a structural level, but I do think that there has been a kind of transformation of the liberal order over the last uh, uh, 20 or 30 years. And this is also an argument that I try to develop in this book, that the, the heyday of the liberal order was a kind of Cold War uh, phenomenon, that it occurred inside of the, um, uh, inside of the um, uh, Cold War bipolar system. Uh, we called it the free world. It was seen as one of two rival um, projects for modernity. The Soviet Union was offering a second pathway to the future. Uh, and there was a kind of competition. Uh, and there was inside of this Western liberal order, uh, the development of kind of a, of a, of, a, of, a, of truly a kind of working political order. It had a kind of club-like, or what I would say, a kind of mutual aid society logic to it, a, a club logic. To be inside of it was to gain trade advantages, to be part of an intergovernmental system that reinforced the ability of governments to solve problems. Uh, there was obviously security 
uh, guarantees through the alliance system. And countries didn't just uh, join it and get things from it, they contributed to it by buying into a suite of responsibilities and duties to be part of it. And so the story of what went wrong or what has led to the weakening of liberal order, I argue, is that this inside order became the outside order. It, it succeeded all too, all too well. It became, a, it was a, a Carl Polanyi problem, not an E.H. Carr problem. It was a problem of, of, of overrunning its foundations. And we haven't really found a way to rebuild those foundations. The, the club, if you will, became a kind of shopping mall where countries could come in and get advantages by, by tying themselves to particular institutions, but they didn't have to join the whole system. And I do think that that has led to a deterioration in the high performance level of that order because countries are not uh, contributing to uh, hammering out shared norms and social purposes that used to be at the core of this order. And I do think that that's partly a story of China um, uh, being able to come into this order to gain certain advantages of it, but not really buying into the larger uh, human rights and, uh, and uh, values that, that have been so important to creating a kind of coherent functioning order. Let me just finish my remarks, if I can, with just uh, coming back to kind of the, the world we're living in um, uh, and Biden and US-China relations. And in some sense, I think it's good news and bad news for US-China relations. I think it's good news in that China will find itself confronting a more coherent, less unpredictable, and let's face it, chaotic America. So I think there's a kind of coherence in the other that China faces, the, the other being the United States and to, the, to a larger extent, the, the alliances and democracies that are part of its system. Um, but it, I don't think it's necessarily good news fully uh, to if we want to look down on these relations and, and, and wish for the best, because I do think that uh, uh, Biden and the American foreign policy establishment really does increasingly see the great struggle for the world in the 21st century being a competition between an American and Western liberal vision of, of modernity and what increasingly I think President Xi is, is offering to the world as a, a very different vision, the Western vision of liberal capitalist democracy and and I, we're going to talk about this, but a, a Chinese vision of capitalism without liberalism and without democracy. And those are very different, what, what uh, Jürgen Habermas, the great German philosopher, calls modernity projects. And so the stakes are very high. And I think Trump was not, was dis disrupting US-China relations, but for more parochial reasons. I think the struggle in the hands of, of a Biden is to appreciate uh, the larger world historical moment that we're in. And so there will be uh, probably more attention to human rights. Uh, uh, Americans weep when they see young people in Hong Kong getting arrested because they want democracy. And there will be attention to the million Uyghurs in Western China that uh, uh, are, are in re-education camps. Uh, there will be uh, uh, value struggle, in other words. I think there will be a struggle over technology and platforms for science and um, communications and computing, uh, a kind of a competition for platforms. Um, uh, and I think there will be um, uh, a, a kind of, and this is where I would return now to the good news, if you will, uh, the a kind of competition for, for leadership. And, and this is kind of the last point I wanna make in closing because it's the most optimistic point I could, could, uh, could give on a, on a day like this, um, that in some sense, what we want to hope for is not that China and the United States will, will come into harmony. That's not gonna happen. We are in for a generation of competition and rivalry 
but but we can hope that the rivalry will have a kind of constructive underpinning that China and the United States will seek to outdo the other by pr providing better uh, uh, solutions to problems to the world. Uh, 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 I, I've called this performance sweepstakes, performance sweep, sweepstakes. Uh, uh, we talk about uh, performance legitimacy inside of China based on can it generate better life, a better life opportunities for Chinese people. The, the, the larger competition for the world is really a competition for what set of institutions for problem solving are most credible and persuasive. And this is where I think in some sense, um, uh, we could hope for a kind of race to the top as opposed to a race to the bottom. And this might start in, in uh, finally in the area of, of, um, of, of clean energy technology. We have a real problem. The two countries, China and the United States are the greatest emitter of car carbon. Uh, China emits 24% of world total. The United States uh, emits 14%. Uh, uh, together, it's 40 some percent. Uh, and of course, there is a huge amount of work to do to, to get this problem under control. And to the extent what this problem is, a modernity project is one where we are together facing a threat, which is an existential threat to to, to uh, all of us. Uh, and so I think of uh, uh, the great uh, uh, British economist, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who talked about currencies, competition for currencies as being a, a kind of beauty contest. And in some sense, uh, my uh, hope as a kind of liberal internationalist is not that China will uh, eventually uh, move in the direction of liberal democracy. I, I, I I used to think that, I don't think that anymore, but I do think that we can move together on, on, on finding solutions uh, to, to global problems where we both either win or we both lose. And so I'll, I'll leave our, our discussion uh, on that uh, hopefully uh, optimistic note. Well, thank you, Professor Eikenberry, for the wonderful and inspiring talk. Maybe we can add now that there's a global competition for vaccines that could help the rest of the world. It would be wonderful if U.S. and China can compete in a good way in this, in this way, too. So let's now hear um, uh, Professor Yen Shui Tong uh, also talk for about 20 minutes. Okay, thank you, Danny. And uh, uh, John, I uh, enjoy your remarks very much. And also, I read your book, and I know uh, the basic argument, uh, the, the background for you uh, to make these remarks. Well, uh, I'm glad that to hear and John mentioned about the uh, leadership competition. Actually, uh, I think uh, 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 there's a fundamental difference between Trump and the uh, Biden, and uh, not only in terms of their uh, ideology and uh, their professional of uh, leadership and their uh, strategy and uh, for uh, uh, for dealing with the, uh, the rest of the world. But uh, I think uh, there's uh, also one very important uh, uh, difference between the Biden and the Trump is that Trump has no interest to maintain global leadership. So he has uh, said that, repeated that uh, for uh, many times. So Trump never concerned to uh, provide any kind of leadership for the world, but just because America is the most powerful uh, country. So Trump's policy have a, a global influence and Biden is different. And Biden clearly stated, and uh, he will lead the US. And uh, I'm also very happy. He said that he is uh, going to lead the world, not merely by the uh, example of power, but also by power of, uh, uh, by the power of example. And uh, just like uh, uh, what I discussed in my book, Ancient Chinese Thought, Modern Chinese Power, just now uh, um, uh, Daniel mentioned the book. And uh, actually, I think this is a really positive. If uh, Biden really can provide uh, leadership of human authority, that's a, a really a, a good thing for every country. And uh, when uh, the strongest of power becomes a benign to the other countries, that's really a uh, very, very uh, good things.
But then the second point I'm going to uh, discuss, I think that this is a very crucial, is that is that possible for Biden to provide that kind of a leadership? That's a, a, a practical issue. It's not a theoretical idea or ideological issue. Biden is a nice guy. And I, I think he's a, a, a true believer of a liberalism. And he really want to uh, 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 create a, buy, uh, a good world order. But then he had to and uh, uh, focus his energy on domestic issues because America has uh, divided so much by Trump administration. And so first, I doubt how many energy and the resources and Biden can spend on his, his foreign policy. That's a, 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 a very practical issue. And uh, for, uh, if you uh, read uh, his uh, uh, inauguration speech, you find that he spent most of the time talking about domestic issues, right? only five minutes, very, very little time about the foreign policy. From my understanding, he, he do not have uh, accept uh, the principle to, uh, uh, to uh, reunite uh, uh, traditional allies to resume traditional uh, uh, resume the strategic relations with the traditional allies. I don't think he have any other things uh, very clear for his foreign policy. Now, facing such a kind of a domestic chaotic situation, he have to heavily focus on his energy on domestic issues. And the second, and also about his uh, 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 idea about his uh, uh, global leadership. And he said that he wants to lead the world by example. Okay, what kind of example he can create in the United States? So the world is not only uh, uh, to see what's his foreign policy, but also to see what he can do with his own country. And I argue that all of our authorities, I mean, international authorities, is based on achievements, both domestic and international. So if Biden cannot make a, a domestic achievements, I doubt he can lead the world with the example because the example is based on domestic achievements. First, whether Biden can adopt a policy effectively to deal with the pandemic, I'm not so sure. I don't know. I know it's very difficult because it's not because of his policy, it's because of Trump's policy already make the pandemic situation in the US becomes a disaster. It's, a, it's a much more difficult to, hand, to deal with the pandemic uh, uh, situation in the US than in any other countries. So this is a very, very uh, 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 difficult task for Biden to, uh, to, uh, to handle. And uh, this is one thing. Second is economy. And uh, the people are so secular in every country. In the, especially in the modern society, and the, just now John used the term of modernity. And the modernity is so commercial. Modernity is so capitalist. Modernity is so mon money oriented. So in, in terms of the modern society, people judge a country, uh, whether it's a model or sample or not, based on what? Monetary standard. How much money you can generate? How, much, how rich you are? How, uh, how, how much richer you are than me. So these kind of thing make people judge the US according to their economy. How much can Biden resume our market's economy? From my understanding, the current pandemic situation in the US make the economy very difficult to resume normally. And uh, according to China's experience, if we cannot control the uh, pandemic, it's no way to, uh, to, to make the economy and not that bad like other countries, just a little bit better than other countries. So I think that the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, control, uh, con controlling pandemic uh, threat is the number one uh, work for uh, Biden because only based on that achievement, that's a, uh, 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 medical achievements, he can talking about how to resume America's economy. So if he cannot, uh, control the pandemic, he cannot make the economy resume effectively. I doubt he can provide, he can lead in the world with an example. So what example? 
it is. So the majority is uh, so uh, uh, commercial. And uh, third point is about the word order. So what kind of word order we are going to have? My understanding now we are moving into a uh, digital age. This is a different, different from the Cold War, different from the uh, uh, war, uh, uh, the history before uh, World War II. And it's so different in human being. What do you mean digital age? Data age means that uh, human's life in the cyberspace is enlarging and uh, people's life in natural space is uh, shrinking. So the V generation already spend more time in cyberspace rather than a natural space. That means more time online rather than offline life. And uh, 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 except the, the sleeping time. So if they have uh, 16 hours, eight hours for sleep, 16 hours for life, and uh, then they spend definitely more than eight hours online. So they, they represent the future, they represent the history, they represent the, the human being, the, the life, what do I mean? The, in the future, not today already happened, the wealth mainly generated from the digital economy. For Germany, the digital economy accounts more than 50% of the GDP. China is already 30%. And the US, I guess, is nearly, at least nearly the 50%, maybe more. So the wealth were generated from the, 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 the digital economy. Right? Uh, uh. And meanwhile, the national security heavily focused on what? The cybersecurity. The security about territory, about the sea, about the air, still important. But then you find that the cyber security is a squeeze is squeezing the the importance of the nitro, uh, security, a uh, uh, territory security. So what does it mean? It means that in this uh, uh, new uh, uh, this kind of uh, digital life, and the human beings' uh, focus is a. Uh, Oh, I mean, the competition between China and US, make it more specific. The competition between China and US will heavily focus on the uh, 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 digital area rather than geopolitical competition. So we cannot, for my, that's my view. I don't think we are going to see the world and uh, the world order and be shaped by the geopolitical competition. I will see the world order will be shaped by the digital competition. What's the difference between digital competition and the geopolitical competition? Geopolitical competition means superpowers try to control the natural land, control the strategic uh, uh, areas, and control the natural so uh, resources. But in the digital air, superpowers will compete for digital superiority. They compete for digital technology invention. And uh, these, can, so I mean that these are uh, actually a lot of uh, Trump's policy against uh, China, very possibly continued by Biden. For instance, technology decoupling. Technology decoupling is not a wider, uh, no matter the, the, the American's uh, uh, president is uh, anti-China or not, for Americans' own technology superiority. He definitely will do it. He worry about the China's technology capability surpass the United States. So in that way, they want to uh, uh, contain China's technology uh, progress. And uh, because there's a technology gap between China and US. So when someday, when China's technology is more superior than the United States, I think the US will against the policy of decoupling. And China will protect its uh, the technology invention and the, from being known by the US. And then US will ask, hey, wait a minute, we should not have a decoupling. And China, you should open your door to us. <laughs> you know, the, currently the decoupling, technology decoupling policy adopted by Trump administration because America have a technology, technology superiority over China. When America is in the position of a technology the, 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 the what uh, subordinates to the China, they will change their policy. So what I want to say, I will say that 
Now, labor order, my understanding, it's a very difficult to resume. And the first, I want to say, maybe I have a different view about the history of liberal internationalism. And uh, concerning the word order, uh, uh, labor order, I will say it started from the uh, 1992. That means uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union. During the Cold War, the, the labor order only for some country, not a global order. It's an order for a small club of Western countries. So after, World, after Cold War, then the labor order becomes a global order. So that's it. Second, for China, and okay, now uh, before I finish this, uh, before uh, I have to talk about this uh, a little bit, uh, then move to China. And uh, concerning the digital age, my understanding, the globalization becomes uh, very difficult to move forward. Globalization is a core part of uh, internet, uh, uh, liberal internationalism. And they ask, uh, they certainly happy to see the internet and the globalization of everything. But uh, unfortunately, the digital technology make the globalization becomes uh, very difficult. And uh, because the cyberspace is becomes a major part all of the members of the UN were concerned how to protect their cyber sovereignty. So we are going to see, usually it's a, it's a free world in the cyberspace because what? It's not that important. But now when it becomes really important, maybe more important than the natural territory and the, all of these countries, I mean the nations, they will protect their own cyberspace. So now the even the US Trump administration argue that a country cannot protect their cyber sovereignty. It is not a nation state. That's what uh, Pompeo said in the Europe. And so from my understanding, all of the countries will support the idea of uh, cyber uh, sovereignty. And so the UN already, already have uh, uh, experts a team to discuss about the issue and the people talking about possibly we need a new UN Charter, just like that what we had in 1945 to govern the state's behavior in uh, cyber, uh, cyberspace. So in the future, we are going to see what the deglobalization or the anti-globalization is the new momentum. I doubt the globalization will move forward. And especially after the pandemic, legitimize all countries' uh, uh, policy to what? To de uh, 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 deglobalization. They say, oh, okay, now the rely on international uh, production chain or supply uh, supply chain is uh, dangerous, it's uh, risky. So the pandemic tells us uh, we cannot rely on foreign productions too much. So every country what? will shorten the global uh, 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 supply chains. And some country, major powers, even to domesticize their production chains, right? So in, uh, at this moment, the world today we are use a, a Zoom to have this meeting because uh, 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 the, the uh, John is uh, 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 in the U.S. If we have a, a meeting with a, a French scholars, they won't use Zoom; they use their own. Let alone Russia, Iran, even Singapore. They do not use, have international meetings with Zoom. Every country worry about others to, to uh, what uh, intelligent or uh, recorded uh, what they said. So the world is uh, moving toward the, uh, what the 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 uh, 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 what, what is the term? Uh, segmentation. The world is moving in the direction of segmentation rather than globalization. And then come to China. Well, just now, uh, John supposed China enjoys, uh, uh, Chinese enjoys the life, uh, the best in 2000 years. If you're talking about the material life, that's true. But uh, that's not a specific situation for China. That's the truth for every country. And uh, 100 years ago, no, no country has the uh, a smartphone, right? No country can have a car, uh, 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 hundred years ago, no, no country have uh, automatic cars. So 
My argument is that material life improved in China. It doesn't mean internationally China have the best time in history. That's why at this moment, Chinese government and also people still seek a uh, uh, run after for the goal of a re uh, national re uh, rejuvenation. National rejuvenation means they are trying to make China as a respected as a Tang dynasty in history. That means a uh, thousand years ago, when China was the only superpower and no country is stronger than anyone else. So if you're talking about international relations and the China's uh, international position is not the best time. And uh, so in that way, I will argue that and uh, uh, China, my understanding at this moment and uh, do not have a confidence to provide a leadership uh, accepted by everyone. And John, I think uh, at least you think that a kind of a, a order, internet labor order uh, will be accepted by everyone, welcomed by most country. I will say that's the situation after Cold War. After Cold War, in the post-Cold War period, that's absolutely true. The labor order was welcomed by almost every country, except a very, very few uh, uh, exceptions. But today, I doubt. The reason is that labor, labor, labor order and make us many, many people feel frustrated. First, they see the labor order actually go to extreme, no longer tolerate the other's opinion. Actually, liberalist, liberalism means a tolerate tolerate different opinions. But now today you see, and even Trump, his account, Twitter account being blocked. So people say, hey, wait a minute, is this labor order? So labor order, no, people, I have a, a debate with my daughter. He said, no, our situation is different from China. And we block, this a private company have the power to block the, uh, the president uh, account. As I said, from my understanding, that's not true. Okay, Trump is a president, they block the account. Now, Trump is no longer president. Should they continue to block Trump's account or they should resume Trump's account? Trump already becomes an ordinary people. And second, without Biden and Pelosi's support, I doubt the Twitter dare to <laughs> block Trump's account. So they get political support from, from the coming, pre, coming, uh, coming uh, uh, leadership. So this is a kind of thing like what? A, a, little, a little bit like the political situation in the South Korea. The new government and the punish the previous government and send the previous president into the uh, uh, prison. So I don't know whether they will happen, but one thing is very clear. And the Trump and the, the treatment to Trump, I do not mean Trump is nice guy, but I mean the Trump, the, the treatment to Trump seem to me do not be inconsistent with the ideal liberalism. And, uh, and also the uh, last, last thing I want to say is about the uh, uh, ideology. And uh, in China, I don't think, uh, I, uh, very few people, and uh, they like Trump. There may be some, just like in U U.S., uh, there's a 50, uh, maybe 50% of people uh, love, uh, like Trump. In China, uh, the tr uh, Trump uh, of uh, what are the, the, the uh, lovers are minority. But the Trump is the only president did not launch a war after the Cold War. Among all of these presidents, Trump is the most uh, peaceful. He didn't launch any war against the uh, uh, other countries. So now when we come talking about the new order and uh, just not John talking about the competition between China and US in fields of the ideology, I doubt that is a good thing because uh, the at least uh, the first three years, Trump ignored ideology. He picked up the ideological competition with China from the uh, March and uh, March or April of uh, 2020. Before that, Trump do not like the idea have an ideological competition, a uh, 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 struggle against China. 
And my understanding, Cold War we, is not a peace, it's not peace. Cold War is a full of wars, proxy wars, right? And all of the proxy wars, mainly based on what? Based on ideological competition. Soviet Union and the US, they compete against each other and through the ex uh, uh, expanding ideological, ideological uh, expansion and then to control the other country's ideology and the political system. So these uh, caused uh, all of these uh, proxy wars. And the Trump didn't launch war uh, partially, maybe mainly because Trump do not want to have an ideological competition with others. And uh, so today, last point is that whether China and the US will have an ideological competition for a world, a world order, my understanding, Biden definitely, definitely will do. Biden definitely will and uh, uh, advance a liberalism in the world and he won't fight against, uh, uh, fight, uh, uh, against China in the uh, fields of the ideology. But China clearly stated from the July 7th last year and the four times Chinese government repeated, China do not want to have uh, any ideological competition with the United States. That means uh, let Biden do it, but China try to avoid this kind, uh, kind of competition. So I doubt Biden can make the ideological competition uh, uh, come uh, to come. The reason is that if you have a competition, you need two players. You one, you, can, you, you cannot uh, have competition by one side only. So from my understanding in the digital age, the competition between China and the US will heavily focus on technology uh, 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 invention, the technology superiority rather than ideology. Okay, I wrap up. And uh, just that's uh, my arguments about the uh, new world order and the military. So uh, thank you, Professor Yen. Um, also inspiring and also a reminder of the many problems we face. I think we have many areas of disagreement and I hope we can explore those because that's the way to learn from each other. I think as academics, we're definitely committed to uh, open exchange and <laughs> freedom of speech. Um, but let me just say, just say one area of agreement that may not be so obvious. Um, I think Professor um, Eikenberry defends an ideal called liberal internationalism. Professor Yen defends an ideal called humane authority. And what this means, I think for both of them is that both countries have to set a good example at home. Um, the US has to be more true to its liberal values at home, and China has to be more humane in the way that it treats its citizens at home. And in terms of the world, also, there's a need for cooperation um, to, on global challenges, such as climate change and pandemics and arms control. And Professor Yan mentioned there's a need for some sort of UN charter that governs um, cyberspace, regulation of AI. Obviously, there's a need for global uh, cooperation on those challenges. And also sometimes we should allow for competition as Professor Eikenberry said, uh, both countries can compete to do good in the world, whether it's compete to do good in terms of uh, promoting uh, clean energy or promoting vaccines that deal with pandemics, that's all good for the rest of the world. So I think there's a lot of agreement notwithstanding the disagreement. I, I was thinking what would be a proper terminology of capturing that area of agreement. Again, we have in one ideal liberal internationalism, I, frankly speaking, that won't be widely accepted in China, I, I think, because liberalism is so much central to the Western tradition. Um, and of course we want to learn, but it's not, it's, it won't necessarily be viewed as, as a central value uh, in China. I think even Professor Eikenberry recognizes that. On the other hand, we have this idea of humane authority. Um, that arguably is central to Chinese culture anyway. So what would be a way of capturing the area of agreement? What would you like the term humane internationalism? Can we use that label as, as some sort of area of agreement? Uh, an ideal that can be agreed upon by both the US and China. Let me just throw that out. But let, let's first allow for Professor Eikenberry to respond to Professor Yen. Thank you. Thank you for those very insightful points. And, and Professor Yan, I really enjoyed your comments and, and learned from them. I do think we're, you know, I think we're, there are things that we do disagree on, and but other things we agree on. Let, let me make my list. First of all, what is the liberal international order? Now, for me, 
that order, as I write in the book, only emerged with the rise of liberal democracies. In the age of democratic revolutions, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the rise of liberal democracies from really a world where there was no democracy in the late 18th and early 19th century, it was really about these countries rising up in the world, uh, uh, um, uh, finding struggles with non-liberal uh, democratic states, and finding themselves in a position where they could build order. And they did it um, through uh, refracting their own principles into the international system. And so really, it, it becomes a project for the United States after World War II, when the United States lived through the 30s and early 40s, when liberal democracy was hanging by a thread. It really was a kind of extinction moment when you had seven or eight countries that were liberal democracies left in the world. Um, and uh, the question was, is this, a, is this system of government with these values that we hold dear going to survive? And so the, the real project was to build a kind of structure around them to protect them, to strengthen them, to facilitate cooperation between them. So my answer to you is liberal international order is not a global order. It's not a vision of a global order unless all countries in the world are, are liberal democracies because short of that, it is a subsystem order. It's a order for countries that share a set of social purposes that they want to strengthen through order building. And liberal democracies do have things in common that separate them from countries like China. They are, liberal democracy is built around contradictions and tensions. Think about the values you're trying to keep in play if you are a liberal democracy. Liberty and equality, individualism and community, sovereignty and interdependence. You can't have 100% of both because when you move in one direction, you uh, uh, challenge the other direction. So you're always in this infinite re, uh, process of making choices, balancing, thinking about trade-offs, trying to get the best position you can among values that are in tension with each other. Your liberal democracies are also different than non-democracies because they fear that their institutions, which have limited governments, have constitutional governments, Republican rule, are that is a type of government that is easily vulnerable to geopolitics. This is the oldest insight from Republican political theory that goes back to Polybius and through Machiavelli and uh, uh, Montesquieu and others that republics are, are somewhat fragile, kind of like orchids. They need to have a kind of structure around them to protect them. So the argument about what is liberal internationalism, liberal internationalism is about building a container around liberal democracies so they can survive. Think of liberal international order as like an egg carton in which you put eggs. Eggs need to be protected by an egg carton. And liberal international order building is building egg cartons for fragile eggs that we call liberal democracies. And so it is absolutely true that a successful liberal international order is not an order that will be universal. And so that I think helps, underst helps me understand why what I'm saying is not always congruent with what you're arguing, uh, because I, do, I don't take it as a limit or as a criticism that liberal international order is not universally liked because you don't want it to be universally liked. You don't want uh, Erdogan to like it. You don't want uh, 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 you don't want Putin to like it. You're doing something wrong if Putin likes your international order. And I'll have to say, I, if if she were to like it, I would say it's probably not my liberal international order either. So there is a it is an, it is a limited uh, project because you are trying to protect social purposes that are not universally shared. So that's where, where we may disagree. Where I think we agree uh, kind of indirectly is that a great powers domestic system is relevant to its international leadership. And that's something you argued. And I, I wrote that down, I agree with that. And because you were arguing 
the U.S. is not going to be a great leader unless it can get its liberal democratic house in order. And so you said that Biden, if he wants to lead, he still won't be able to unless he can solve domestic problems, problems of democracy, of polarization, but also of the COVID. And what I think is true, and I think that's right, and I do think that the, there's a broader point that you're making there about the way governments treat their domestic society is relevant to how they treat their international uh, uh, partners and adversaries. The, the way you treat your own people at home tells you something about the way you will treat your other people outside of your country. Uh, I've, I've made, so, and, and for me, that is not necessarily good news for either the United States or China, but I, don't, I do think there is a real question whether China can be an international leader and have a closed authoritarian autocratic system without freedoms. I, I, I don't know whether the world will organize itself around a China that is, is of that sort. And I, know, I don't know whether the world will organize itself around the United States that is in total chaos. So both countries, I think, have limits to their leadership based on very different domestic maladies and shortcomings. So I, I think we agree that the domestic story of a country is rel relevant to its international story. Um, I want to make one other comment about technology, because I think your major thesis is, is right, that technological competition is the is the uh, major form of competition uh, in the future. Now, I, I, I think you're, too, you're saying that too strongly when it comes to geopolitics not being important. Um, I could imagine a war between the United States and China over Taiwan or over uh, Chinese uh, encroachments on other countries' ter uh, maritime territory in the South China Sea or the East China Sea. So I think geopolitics still matters. And I hope that both uh, China and its neighbors are restrained uh, so that we don't test my proposition. But I think your larger question about digital reality being where the action is, is right. And I just wanted to make, make one final com conversation uh, comment about that. Um, internet, uh, social media, the, the connection between computing and telecommunications, all these things that we associate with the cyber world. What's interesting is that that technology has had different implications for China and the United States. In China, as I read it, technologies have created greater capacity for the state to surveil society and keep track of people uh, uh, and uh, monitor uh, civil society such as it is. It's created more authority to the state. We call it uh, big data authoritarianism. It creates more advantages for China to, to solve author problems of authoritarian rule that uh, the Soviet Union could not solve, a more sophisticated form of control from the top. Whereas in the United States, the same media has fragmented America. Uh, America is divided into um, different uh, eco information zones. Uh, people who watch certain tel television networks believe different things than people who watch other television networks. It's like in America, the same technology is not strengthening the state and the, the national unity, it's breaking us apart. So I just think, I think that's very interesting that technology can, can take countries in very different directions. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how that will play out, but I do think it's, I, 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 I'm, I think both are problems and uh, it, they are problems that, that are tied to our, our technological uh, world that we live in. I have got one more point about democracy, but I want to kind of leave that aside because I've spoken quite a bit and I wanted to let uh, Xuang do uh, have a chance to come back at me. Shui Tong, do you want to come back? Professor Yen? Okay. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I think that's a, a very, uh, very good uh, uh, remarks and response to uh, my opinion. 
And uh, actually, I uh, fully agree this uh, uh, idea. Without liberalism, there's no labor order. So labor order is something very new. It's a based on idea and from the, uh, Europe, right? When they have the idea, without the, the ideology, this ideology of liberalism, you can never have a, a labor order. So in, uh, I already go, uh, went through your book and, uh, oh, okay, before I respond to your, your remarks, I just wonder why you call uh, Wilson by his name, but when you call uh, 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 Roswell, you, you use uh, abbreviation. <laughs> uh, Who's? Uh, uh, you use uh, uh, what? Uh, D, uh, DR, uh, FDR. Why you call him uh, FDR? Oh, FDR. Uh, Why you do not call his name? Professor Bell, do you, uh, that's uh, an Americanism that maybe doesn't translate well, but we, the same way we called uh, John F. Kennedy, JFK. Yeah, but, but then why you do not use the operation for the uh, Wilson? <laughs> you know, I, WW, I, <laughs> actually Woodrow is his middle name. His first name was Thomas. So uh -huh. uh, TWW, somehow it doesn't roll <laughs> off your, your tongue. Uh, uh, um, and I, I, I don't think, I guess Trump and uh, Biden probably are not going to have their initials used either because it, somehow it doesn't quite, it doesn't flow off of the tongue. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, it has nothing to do with your personal uh, respect with the discipline. No, no, no. No, okay. no. <laughs> I saw Pop, Pop, perhaps you have a, some kind of a special personal uh, <laughs> feeling or uh, respect. It's, it's a more generic uh, usage in America. Oh, okay, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I, I think this is a, a very, uh, very good, and so make it is clear. And if we want to understand the labor order, you must understand what is liberalism yeah, uh, at root. And also, we I agree with you that this uh, labor order started from a small club, and then it becomes a bigger club, and by people join this club, right? So in that way, you define the order in what? in a, a small society. That means that uh, all of these members of this order, they just uh, 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 organize like a society. So you do not concern about the order is uh, cover uh, the two different societies, right? That's, uh, that, that's my understanding. Actually, when I define the international order, I will become, uh, define it as the whole system. In ancient times, the small, the all of the international system are separated. So these are order and uh, it's a system order. So here you define the order is not from the system uh, uh, level, but from a society level. That means for this society, they have a, a order. And for that society, they have another kind of a, a order, B order. So that, that's it. That's why I'm concerned before the code before the uh, 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 post Cold War, and uh, the even you have uh, more than forty countries that join this uh, labor order, it's just a part of the world. It's a minority of the world. It's not the whole world. But after the uh, Cold War, Cold War situation change, there's a majority of international members and accept this order, right? So even there's a still some countries do not join this club, but they're minority the labor order becomes uh, represent the majority. That's why we treat it as a global order, even there's a, a small exceptions. So in that way, I think for realists, when we're talking about the order, we always concern, it should be the system, system order, that we including competition powers, between including enemies. So, we, so that's why we see, when we say there's a wall, we say, okay, the order is undermined. When there's no war, we saw we see the order resume, even they have a different ideology and anything. So order can be looked at from two aspects. One, like you argue about it, the character of the order from the norms, right? We may call it a, 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 a normative order. But then from the other perspective, we can may call it a structural order. Whether the order is a stable, the order, or is unstable. That means whether there's a war or less war or no war, right? So this, uh, so when we talk about order, we have two things, and uh, this is also related to the the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, well, uh, Daniel's uh, uh, question, and what's the name for it? I already use the name, an easy piece uh, for the new order. The new order is that the competition between China and US is inevitable, but they will compete peacefully. Peacefully mean, doesn't mean that they are uh, they're friends to each other. They're still maybe a very, very hard uh, on each other. There may be our enemies, but then they said, let's compete without a war. We compete with all kinds of forms, but not war, except a war. So that's why I call it uh, an easy peace. This is a peaceful competition. So in that way, I will say that the, this uh, whether China will provide a leadership for the uh, system order, my understanding, it's impossible. What means leadership? Leadership means uh, leading powers with the followers, right? Without followers, there's no leadership. So that depends on how many, how many countries follow you. At this moment, from my understanding, China's popularity, Chinese leadership popularity is, in, is uh, uh, increasing. And more and more countries want to follow China's leadership. But unfortunately, there are large in number, but uh, they are weak in, uh, uh, in capability. So the leadership can be uh, 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 what uh, measured from two aspects, the quality and the popularity. China's, the lead, Chinese leadership is uh, increasing in terms of uh, popularity, that in more and more developing countries uh, and uh, follow uh, China's leadership. But the quality is not that high. America's uh, leadership, if Biden provides the uh, what uh, uh, human uh, uh, human authority, and that U.S. you reunited these traditional allies, they're not uh, large in number, but they're they're heavy in power, right? They have larger GDP, and they have a more uh, global influence. So the quality is high. So if we uh, dis uh, uh, discuss about uh, the two leadership by China and the US, I think Biden possibly can create a high quality leadership, but I doubt it's uh, the popularity is a very, very high. And, uh, but China may uh, improve its uh, leadership's uh, popularity, but the quality is a very difficult because uh, most of uh, uh, Western countries will prefer to follow Ben rather than to follow Beijing, right? That's the difference. That's uh, what I'm concerned. The, the, uh, the fourth point is about the geopolitics. I think uh, John's right. And the geopolitics is still important. I do not in, uh, say that uh, geopolitical uh, uh, things is no longer important. It is still important. But its importance is uh, declining rather than increasing. That means that it becomes more and more important. No, it's the importance is declining because of the digital issues will become more and more important. So they squeeze and the, 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 the importance of the geopolitical issues. Come to Taiwan issue. Well, even uh, the, the Trump and the very provocative policy and the, towards China on the Taiwan issue and didn't cause a, a, a real war between uh, our con uh, two countries. I think uh, Biden will be very rational. And Biden has already, and from my understanding, clearly, and uh, 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 oh, okay, he didn't mention China US relations in his uh, inauguration speech. I think that this is a positive. That means uh, he do not uh, want to. Uh, 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 gave a, a very provocative uh, policy in his speech uh, uh, towards China. And so that will bound his future policy. He leave, he, without mentioning china US relationship, means that he leaves a big room for himself to adjust American policy toward China. So his policy toward Taiwan, uh, my understanding, will be very rational. He do not want to have a war over there. He, because he worry about the war may escalating into nuclear war, that's a disaster. So I think that for all laborers to understand that. And the final point is about the technology. My understanding, the 
digital technology not only improve, increase the Chinese government's capability and to sur survey their uh, people. It's happened to every country, including the United States. Like uh, Asante and uh, Snowden, they all, all these two guys revealed how the uh, CIA or FBI surveilling American uh, people. So I think uh, this is a, what, uh, this is a new project we are studying. And uh, why the digital technology? Well, because in the US, a lot of people uh, say that, uh, and the Trump ruled the country through Twitter and the, this uh, uh, violent action uh, over the uh, capital because of the uh, Twitter, because of uh, uh, the digital technology, my understanding. That's only partially true. And another part is more important than that. Actually, the government have uh, used the digital technology more than people. And the digital technology already increased the power of all of the uh, governments in every country. So in the future, my understanding, technology is a very, very anti-liberal. And the technology in some way it's anti-liberalism, uh, 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 anti the uh, liberal ideas. I do not mean that technology uh, uh, have a, a su uh, subjectively want to do it, but objective result is that the future technology will make the old governments in every country and the powerful uh, over their own people. And the last, I think of, I'm not that uh, optimistic <laughs> like the, uh, uh, John. John seemed to me after Biden win the election, you think it's a great chance to see the liberal order to resume. Well, I'm not that optimistic. I think the history is moving backward. And so I use the term retrogress. The world is moving into the retrogress and the direction rather than the progress. And uh, sometimes that's a history. And the uh, moral realism and uh, attribute to the leadership as the uh, 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 independent variable, uh, one of its uh, uh, advantage, it can explain why history sometimes uh, making backward. I I just want to respond to a couple of things. I, I I I don't I I don't think all countries can use information technologies in the same way to spy on their domestic populations and surveil them. I there there are I mean it's. It's illegal for American, uh, the American state to, to tap the phones of American people or look at their bank accounts. We have an independent judiciary where you can take the government to court and sue them if there is a infringement on your freedom of privacy. So uh, there, you're right, the technology is kind of structurally speaking empowering to uh, to, to states, but that's why you need to have institutions that counterbalance the strong government. And thank goodness some governments have those kind of independent checks and balances, private property, rule of law. I mean, we need to, if, if I think you and I would agree that at the end of the 21st century, one of the things that we would like our grandchildren and great grandchildren to have in their grasp so that they can confront 22nd century problems is to live in societies where their, their civil societies are outside the reach of a, of a predatory state where they have some independence or autonomy so they can live their lives, have their information, they can, they can be free from interference from the state. And how do we make sure that in a hundred years there are societies that have that value secured? I think you have to have institutions, legal institutions, constitutional institutions that allow you to protect those uh, uh, civic uh, rights. Uh, and, and so I, I, I don't think, uh, and I do think that we have those in some countries. And I also think that it mattered that when this Trump era is over, we can look at the United States and say that it, the United States threw out the world, the, the worst president in American history. He was, you know, the, the criminality, the, the corruption, the, the, the uh, all the different maladies we associate with Trump. Uh, he, 
he was they were identified and he was thrown out of office. We voted the, the system worked in some sense. And I think that's the basis for the rejuvenation of democracy, because you always are going to have these moments where you're put to the test, the stress test. Imagine if Trump were able to 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 be able to proclaim that he could have that office of presidency for life. The world would have been shocked by that, and it didn't happen. And so uh, I think we saved ourselves, and I think that has a kind of moral resonance around the world for people who want to protect themselves from, from strong states. Now, um, I, I have, if we have time, Professor Bell, uh, should I, do I have time for one more point or? Go ahead, please. Um, I wanted to make a point about international order, which is one of our subjects tonight. And I, I, I guess I, Shui Tong, I agree with you that liberal order is not global order. And we think we agreed on that. And that there are other things about order that have to be put in place other than arrangements to uh, protect and facilitate liberal democracies. The way I would say it, looking and listening to our conversation tonight, that there are that when countries go into the international system and they try to build international order, there are four things they try to, different things they try to do. One is, is realist things, which is what you're interested in, security, uh, to, to build structures to prevent countries from uh, being subject to violent predation from other countries. So the pro we build international order to achieve security. And realist theory is our most wonderful set of ideas about how states do that, the balance of power and deterrence and so forth. The second reason countries go into the international order to build order is what I'll call manage interdependence. Those are the problems of modernity, the fact, fact that we get things from, inter, from exchanging with, with each other, we benefit, mutually benefit from trade, let's say, or uh, exchanging information. That's what we're doing tonight on this Zoom call. We're exchanging information. Um, uh, so all of that interdependence is good, but it also can be something that, particularly when it comes to trade and economics, you want to regulate. So we, we, we build international order for the second goal, which is managing interdependence. The third reason co countries go into the international order and build order is what I will call to protect their domestic political institutions and regime principles. What There's a term for that that democracies have. It's to build a world safe for democracy. That's what I've been describing tonight as the liberal international project. One could go into the world and try to make the world safe for autocracy or for uh, revolutionary socialism or for fascism. So you're building international order to protect your way of life. That's the third project of international order building. Uh, and then the fourth one is to achieve some measure of social justice. Historically, countries and peoples go into the international order because they, they feel there's injustice. Uh, colonialized people feel that they were the subject of uh, of racial hierarchies and civilizational hierarchies, and they wanted to redeem their, their sense of, of decency and respect. Uh, uh, and so, so those are four different way, reasons that countries leave their borders, go into the international system and try to organize it. And so when I talk about building a world safe for democracy, I'm talking about one of four things that we have to worry about when we think about international order. And I, I, for me, that's helpful in kind of clarifying different projects that are simultaneously trying to shape the world we live in. Um, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, we're running out of time. So let me ask question, two questions to both of you. 
Um, the first we have from Professor Eikenberry, the view that liberal order is not the same as global order. I mean, I think that's very interesting. And obviously, it's a more modest vision than we had after the end of the Cold War, when there was this view that the end of history is moving towards liberal democracy. Um, and um, it's worth asking, I mean, on, on the one hand, it, it's, uh, it's beautiful and modest. On the other hand, um, it is worth noting that the liberal order still is meant to shape global institutions. So there's still some sort of vision of global order. But I think probably we both recognize that whether it's China or the US, uh, both countries have a rich tradition and civilization and they need to build on their own political culture and, and, and values. And I think we have a clear vision of the US that John um, laid out, uh, especially uh, prioritizing of liberty and equality. Um, what exactly uh, on the Chinese side? I mean, that I think is, is maybe less well known in the West. What are the key values? And Professor Yen developed this idea of humane authority. I mean, this key value of uh, hum humanity or Ren is so central to Chinese political culture. And I think it's very important to worth noting that that's, that's, that's the key. So when we use the language of China, um, we can put it portrayed in a negative way, autocracy and so on. But what are the ideals that underlie the whole thing? Recognizing there's a huge gap between ideals and reality, I think we need to specify those. Uh, the value of harmony, he. in English, it's really better translated as diversity within harmony. I think the Chinese culture also strongly prioritizes um, diversity. And what's the right way of selecting leaders? Again, so there's this whole tradition of political meritocracy that there's political system should aim to select leaders with superior ability and virtue. I mean, just as the, there's a huge gap between, we can say the US is a highly imperfect democracy. So China is a highly imperfect, we can call it humanity, you know, harmony or political meritocracy and both political cultures need to build on their own uh, cultures. But still, my question is different. We also agree that there's, we need to have norms for global order. And if they're not purely liberal and they're not purely Chinese, then what are they? I mean, that's a question I wanna ask for both of you. I propose this terminology based on both of your ideas. Humane internationalism. I mean, how does that sound as a concept to develop? What exactly is the glue, the normative glue that both of you propose can hold together our global order? So that's one question. Second question is about global techno about technology. I think both of you agree that it's so important and will increasingly shape our future. And it can be both good and bad, right? Obviously it's bad in the way that Professor Eikenberry noticed that, that or proposed that if it controls our lives and leaves no space for privacy or freedom, who's, again, you know, who's in favor of living under this totalitarian vision? But it also can be used for good purposes. I mean, arguably the main reason why China has more or less controlled the pandemic is because of the use of technology, you know, which is largely supported by the people as well. So how can we have some sort of vision, a global regulation of technology that can be accepted by both the US and China and the rest of the world? What, would, what form might that take? We, where we want to promote the good forms and minimize the influence of the bad forms. So that's my question for both of you. Perhaps Professor Yen can go first. Okay, thank you, Daniel. And uh, I will uh, make comments to your question first. And, uh, uh, my personal understanding in China, you can hardly find uh, any uh, uh, social or political value uh, overwhelmingly accepted by the people. And in, because of the diversity of the people's uh, diversity, and especially the official value and the society value are quite different. Generally speaking, the society is uh, still influenced a lot by traditional uh, Chinese uh, uh, culture no matter Confucianism or Taoism, these are kind of things. So, and also the, in the modern time, these uh, commercialism have a strong impact on the uh, society. So that's why the government are advocating for uh, 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 the socialist value and uh, 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 justice, uh, fairness, uh, and the loyalty, patriotic, all of these things. So you see, in that way, I would say, and it's hard to say uh, what uh, um, uh, value represent China. So we can see what's the Chinese government's uh, uh, value. That's what they advocate. Actually for the Chinese government, they also have a two set of values. For domestic, there's one thing because it's uh, 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 entangled with the Marxism, right? But uh, internationally, they cannot have a Marxism as a 
a, a value to a guide their foreign policy. So international value is a kind of a entangled with the traditional ideology, just like Daniel said, this uh, uh, diversity of the harmony or uh, peaceful, uh, uh, something like that. So generally speaking, it's really difficult for me to define any value as a, a dominating value in China for uh, suggested for the world at this moment. That, that's one thing. Second, if you ask me and the, what kind of world order I think is the best or the worst uh, a second to uh, concern and uh, all for the human being to uh, establish, I would say fairness and uh, ju uh, justice. Fairness and justice, that's a core value of a China, the tri uh, traditional Chinese uh, 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 political thinking. And also from my understanding, it's a very important part of a liberty. So these, these are possibly, this a shared value by Chinese traditional value and uh, 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 liberalism. And also Chinese government official value mentioned that these two concepts, fairness and uh, uh, justice. I'm not so sure. Democracy, well, democracy is certainly very influential now, but it seemed to me Americans uh, sample established up by Trump already undermined its influence. How much the US can resume the, uh, the democracy influence? And I don't know, but uh, one thing I will say, and uh, this is uh, uh, in the digital age, it's uh, very difficult. Reason is that, just like I said, the technology make the government more powerful than the people, make the government much easier to control their people. And uh, for instance, and in the US, they already arrested over 15,000 people after these uh, turmoils. Not, not only the, the one uh, uh, for uh, uh, over the capital, but also the Black Lives Matters. How can the police arrest the over a uh, 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 15,000 people so quickly, heavily rely on the digital technology, the right, the, 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 uh, all of the trees, these people through the, through the phone, right? So you see that actually not only that, and from my understanding, oh, the core of this idea of liberalism is a rule of law, right? But actually the law from my understanding is only effective on gentlemen, never have any uh, effectively uh, uh, influence the mean people. That's why you have those those uh, the, the, the looters and the uh, rob the shops, right? So my understanding the same thing, and you have the rule of uh, 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 the law for every country, but that's really depends on the leadership. If the leadership want to uh, adhere to the law, they can do it. If they want to undermine it, if they want to change it, they still can do it because they hold the power. That's the why moralism attributes the leadership as the independent variable because they have the power. They can change the law, they can undermine the law, they can replace the law with the new law they is, uh, they like. So that's why in the, my theory is how moralism is uh, challenging the uh, what the institutional determinism, right? The Finally, I want to say, I, I fully agree with John about the four aspects of uh, liberalism, security, managing uh, conflicts, uh, domestic uh, rule of law, and the social justice. Actually, I will view these uh, four things as the uh, four levels of uh, liberalism. It's not the four aspects. And the first, uh, the lowest level is a security because it's closely related to life. And second, and the managing conflicts is related to the social order. And then rule of law is re related to the, whether it's good order or bad order. The, the prison have the, the prison have the uh, very, very uh, <laughs> uh, the, the strict order, but that's not a good order. People prefer the order like university rather than order of the prison. So then the last is a social justice. That's the highest level. Uh, highest level of liberalism. So my understanding, lowest level, lowest level is easy to be achieved. The highest level is the most difficult to achieve. That's why 
late, uh, 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 realism like me, like us, and we are always talking about security and <laughs> conflicts management because we're realists. We think this is possible. Talking about the rule of law and the social justice, certainly we think it is good, but we think it's too difficult to achieve it. That, uh, that's my uh, 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 point. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, one important constraint on freedom of speech is time. So uh, we have five more minutes and let's give the last word to Professor Eikenberry. Well, I, I, on this uh, question of, of, of rule of law, I, I, I'm going to have to insist that, 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 that the, the United States has the moral high ground here. I, China, two years ago, its leader uh, made a decision in the party to, to allow the, the leader to have uh, a rule for life a, and uh, a dictator for life. And uh, there was nobody to stop it. And in the United States, we had a leader that tried to do that and we stopped it. And it, it's a very emotional thing for the United States to, to see ourselves go through four years where the, the future of our institutions, whether the rule of law would hold whether freedom of the spe of speech, whether uh, all the different liberties that we associate with our system would hold, and they have. So I feel very um, uh, worried when there's a kind of effort to say, well, in the United States, they do kind of what we do. I think it, it, they are fundamentally different levels of, of legal protections for individuals and political freedoms that that, that China might not want to protect, but that are very dear to, um, uh, to, a, to a tradition of politics that is deeply rooted in the enlightenment and the rise of the, of, of the modern world. And it's not just a Western story. Look at Taiwan or South Korea or Japan or Hong Kong. You have, uh, uh, um, you, don't, you, you don't have to be Western to have those those, those understandings of what are the most vital sacred features of being a human being. Now, I, I, I would say, what are universal norms? And this is Professor Bell's question, very good question. I think, I, I think the, the, the deepest universalisms that we have to build world order on are, are, uh, are the, enlightenment, uh, uh, the enlightenment values of science, technology, information, learning, freedom to speak, uh, um, uh, education unintimidated by, by political agendas, the enlightenment. That's how we're all living better lives because we have gone through a period of, of, of human advancement based on deep principles of, of reason, science, and human dignity. And those are not Western ideas, those are universal ideas. And, and at, at a more practical level, what is universal? I think, could we agree, China and the United States, that in building international institutions, we want certain basic things. Here are four, transparency, freedom of information, accountability, and individual rights. So when this, uh, this COVID, uh, disease, we want to have transparency of how it emerged and, and so we can prevent it from happening again. We, we should be able to understand how this happened, why this happened, how we can prevent it. It may come from a different country next time. We need to be able to work together to help each other uh, solve problems that if they aren't solved, we all suffer. Uh, I'm suffering. I haven't seen my parents for a year because of this dreadful pandemic. So I want to see my country solve the problem. And I want to see other countries equally transparent in uh, illuminating how we got here. And I think uh, uh, freedom of information, uh, 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 having the, the ability of, of an independent press to, to ask questions uh, without fear or favor, accountability. So I think there are, I don't think those are, those aren't liberal. They're kind of, they're kind of rational things that modern people who, who want to live in, in well-ordered societies would want. Uh, so I think, I, I don't, I'm not pessimistic that this is really a clash of civilizations. 
I think it's, uh, it's definitely imperfect societies that are struggling to be better, but we're struggling with different problems. And uh, I, I, you know, I hope we both succeed. Uh, um, but I, I, I don't think they're the same problems. And I do think uh, there are certain irreducible conditions you need to have in societies to survive this bloody 21st century. And I hope those conditions, which I've described as enlightenment uh, 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 conditions, can, can, can in fact help us get through this century. Thank you. Uh, maybe one last question, and then each one, please stick to less than two minutes. Uh, the first for Professor Yen, what can China learn from the US? And then to Professor Eikenberry, what can the US learn from China? And then we'll end there, hopefully on a constructive note. Well, I think uh, what China can learn is uh, still is uh, the uh, creative uh, 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 spirit. America is a country and uh, full of the uh, spirit of the creation. They want to invent everything new, not only in technology, but also in force, like the people, like the John, always have new ideas in the book, he said, <laughs> so I think this, uh, I don't regard your book as a theory, but I regard book as a uh, uh, source, as a full of source and new ideas. So I think China should learn from the US to how to create new thinking, how to invent a new technology, invent something new. And uh, last I want to say, that's also a way we discuss about the two education systems. And the Chinese can educate the kids pretty well at the uh, primary school and the high school. But come to the ed graduate education, we realize the gap with the US. The reason is that our graduate students are not that creative like uh, American educated stu uh, students. So in terms of what we should learn from US the, is the spirit of uh, uh, invention of creative thinking. Thank you, uh, Professor Eikenberry. What can the U.S. learn from China? I, I think a, a, a certain humility uh, that uh, comes when uh, you look at, at China, which has survived 2,000 years and has had such a noble and uh, a charismatic uh, culture that I think the world is fascinated by and impressed by and, and, and wants to, to be in a world where it, it, it uh, becomes the best that it can be. Uh, so I think a, a kind of uh, helping China can help uh, the United States and the Western world um, uh, uh, have the kind of conversation we're having tonight about trying to 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 learn from the other, to to put yourself in their position, to see how other countries like China are making trade-offs, and to to find uh, to find common ground. So I, I think I think uh, it's an ex it's it's I think it's we got a lot of difficult times ahead for US-China relations, but I, I think um, there can be a, a kind of a working uh, uh, respect for between the countries. Uh, and I think there definitely is between uh, 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 Professor Yan and I, I think we, we, we can maybe uh, be uh, um, models for our own societies uh, where we, we were stubborn, tenacious defenders of, of things that we're passionate about but we're, we, we, we know our own limits and we know that uh, no one has a monopoly on, on insight and knowledge. So we, we need to be together learning from each other. Thank you, <clears throat> beautiful way to end. Both of you wrote very creative um, and excellent books that we can learn from. Um, so let's um, end here and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I have your book. <laughs> I have yours. <laughs> yeah. So this is extraordinary. Thank you very much for all of you professors and um, 